afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. My name's Catherine Clark, and I'm the university librarian and the director of the John Curtin Prime Ministerial Library here at Curtin University. And I'm also the MC for today's event. I'm really pleased to be able to welcome you to the annual John Curtin Prime Ministerial Library's anniversary lecture. And a very special welcome and thank you to our patron, the Honourable Miss Julia Gillard, AC, for being part of our special annual event. We're always happy to see you at Curtin. <laughs> uh, before we commence, can I ask that everyone please uh, just make sure that their phones are turned off or turned to silent? Thank you. Uh, and in the event of an emergency, which I sincerely hope we will not have, but if that does happen, uh, I'll ask you just to follow the instructions from the various staff that we've got at the event today, and the emergency exits are at the back and also at the front here of the building. And the assembly area is on the grassed area either side of us. The lecture's being recorded today and it'll be available at a later date on the John Curtin Prime Ministerial Library website where the lectures from previ previous years are also available. So the program for this afternoon is going to commence with a welcome to country and then we'll have speeches from uh, Curtin's Vice-Chancellor Professor Deborah Terry and our JCPML patron, the Honourable Julia Gillard. And then the 2018 anniversary lecture will be presented by Mr Stan Grant. So if I can ask you to please now welcome Professor Simon Forrest to deliver the welcome to country. Kaya. Kaya. <laughs> Kaya Wanjo. Hello and welcome. My name is Simon Forrest Burungu, and I'm a Wajak Baladong Noongar with King Connections to Yamaji and Wangai peoples. And I'm also elder in residence here at Curtin University. And as a Wajak elder, I'm here to give you a welcome to Nala Budja, my land. I especially welcome countryman Mr. Stan Grant, a Rajari man from the other side of the island. <laughs> I am of this land and place. This is my mother's maternal country. The maternal line of my family have been living on this land, Wajak Noongar Budja, or the Swan Coastal Plain, for a thousand generations, or at least 40,000 years. <coughs> As human beings living on planet Earth, we're all, in a sense, custodians of Mother Earth while we are here. A welcome to country, however, recognises and acknowledges us as the very first Australians and the first and continuing custodians of this land, Australia. I welcome also acknowledges that protocols of the past continue and are relevant in the present and that this land we know as Australia was, is and always will be Aboriginal land. Australia is one of the most culturally diverse nations on our planet and it is the cultural diversity of Australia that makes it a wonderful place to live. As individuals, as a community and as a nation, we all have a responsibility to acknowledge this. We all have to be accepting and skilled in interacting with fellow Australians who may, be, who may be from different cultural backgrounds. I, as an Aboriginal Australian, as a first Australian, embrace the cultural diversity of our nation. <coughs> and in particular, especially welcome people that have come to this country as refugees. At the World Indigenous Peoples Conference on Education in Toronto in September last year, the Six Nations Confederacy, or Haudenosaunee, of Northeast New York State and Southeast Ontario welcomed all the First Nations from around the globe to their land. The Haudenosaunee then requested the first response to their welcome should be afforded to Indigenous Australians. And in doing so, recognised and acknowledged us as the first of the First Peoples. If the First Nations people from across the globe can afford us this sort of acknowledgement as the first of the First Peoples, then surely the nation of Australia can do likewise. And the first step in that is acknowledging and working with us on the Uluru Statement. So 
Sorry, Stan, I knew you were going to talk about the little roost statement, so I don't want to take too much away. Kaya. Kaya Wanju. Nan Krill, Simon Forest, Burungu. Kaya Wanju, Nidja Wadiak Nunga Buja. Nala Kadich Nunga Mord. King Kadich Nidja Buja. Nan Kadich Nunga Kabali, Borong Kori. Thank you. Thank you, Simon, and I'm going off script to say it's a privilege to work with you, so thank you. Uh, so now to officially welcome you to Curtin University, I'm pleased to introduce the Vice-Chancellor, Professor Deb Patel. Thank you very much, Catherine, and thank you, Simon, for your moving welcome to country. And can I take this opportunity to congratulate you on being awarded the 2018 NAIDOC Perth Male Elder of the Year. <laughs> A well-deserved recognition for the wonderful work you do here, both at Curtin University and within our wider community. So can I begin by recognising the traditional owners of the land on which we meet here this afternoon, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, and paying my respects and my thanks to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd particularly like to acknowledge John Curtin, Prime Ministerial Library, JCPML, patron, the Honourable Julia Gillard, AC, former Prime Minister of Australia. The presenter of this year's anniversary lecture, award-winning journalists and author, Mr Stan Grant, our many distinguished guests who are with us this afternoon, friends and colleagues. A very warm welcome to the 2018 John Curtin Prime Ministerial Library Anniversary Lecture. Since 1998, the JCPML Anniversary Lecture has been held here to commemorate the contributions of Prime Minister John Curtin, after whom this university is so proudly named. John Curtin became Prime Minister on the 7th of October 1941 and just two months later, following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbour, he announced that Australia was at war with Japan. His strength of character was evident during this difficult, challenging and dark time in our history. He worked to unite all Australians to secure the nation from attack and to lay the foundations for post-war prosperity. Tragically, John Curtin died on the 5th of July 1945, just weeks before the end of the war. Curtin University established the Prime Ministerial Library to preserve John Curtin's personal papers, to make them publicly accessible and to recognise his political and his social achievements. <coughs> Events such as this le lecture provide an opportunity not only to reflect on the enduring legacy of John Curtin, but also to engage with the thoughts and views of the leaders and commentators of our time. Past lectures have been presented by a number of previous Prime Ministers of Australia, including Gough Whitlam, Paul Keating and Malcolm Fraser as well as many other significant figures from politics, academia, the arts and the public sector. Last year, our patron, the Honourable Julia Gillard, was our anniversary speaker. In a very powerful address, she reflected on John Curtin's personal resilience and how this impacted on his leadership. As she said, and I quote, Curtin's determination never wilted despite the highs and the lows his successes and failures, his journey along the continuum of his own mental health. Each year our anniversary speaker enriches our understanding of who John Curtin was and the ongoing impact of his leadership. I've no doubt that this year's lecturer, Stan Grant, will continue in this great tradition as he reflects on the future survival of liberal democracy. Given all that John Curtin stood for, this is a perfect theme for a JCPML anniversary lecture. 
John Curtin saw universities as a fundamental plank of a strong liberal democracy. And just to paraphrase his words briefly, he saw the true task of a democratic university to make full rounded people of everyone, of all, whether they spend their days in factories, workshops, mines or fields, or in fact in laboratories or lecture rooms. And as he went on to say so eloquently, and again I quote, knowledge after all is social in its origins, social in its nature, and social in its results. But enough from me, given that my main role here tonight is actually to introduce the Honourable Julia Gillard, AC, who will formally introduce tonight's speaker. Ms Gillard was sworn in as the 27th Prime Minister of Australia, our first female Prime Minister, on the 24th of June 2010, and served in that role until June 2013. As Prime Minister... <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> as Prime Minister and in her previous role as Deputy Prime Minister, she played a key role in guiding Australia through the global financial crisis and positioning Australia to seize the benefits of what her government so appropriately referred to as the Asian century. In foreign policy, she secured a stronger architecture for the relationship with China and strengthened ties with India, Japan, Indonesia and South Korea. She also delivered nation-changing policies in health and in education. Post-politics, she has continued to make very significant contributions, particularly in areas that reflect her long-standing commitment to and passion for education. Ms Gillard is a distinguished fellow at the Centre for Universal Education at the Brookings Institution in Washington. In February 2014, she was appointed chair of the Global Partnership for Education, an international body focused on strengthening education systems in developing countries. In addition, she's patron of the Lane Beachley Aim for the Stars Foundation, which supports girls and women to fulfil their potential. She serves as patron of CAMFED, the Campaign for Female Education, which tackles poverty in Africa by educating and empowering young women. In 2017, she became chair of Beyond Blue, Australia's leading mental health awareness body. And in April 2018, she was appointed inaugural chair of the Global Institute for Women's Leadership at King's College in London. So this is an amazingly broad range of distinguished roles. So we were delighted that she also agreed to be patron of the John Curtin Prime Ministerial Library a role that she's held since January 2015. So it's now my great pleasure to invite the Honourable Julia Gillard to the lectern to introduce Mr Stan Grant, who, who will present our anniversary lecture tonight. Thank you very much. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and in a spirit of reconciliation pay my respects to elders past and present. Professor Forrest, thank you for your welcome to country. I would also like to acknowledge our special guests here this evening, members of the Curtin family, Mr Matthew Keogh MP, Federal Member for Burt, Mr Terry Healy MLA, Member of the Western Australian Legislative Assembly, Professor Seth Coonan, Deputy Vice-Chancellor International, Professor Alan Dench, Pro Vice-Chancellor Humanities, and my thanks to our Vice-Chancellor, Professor Deborah Terry, for that very, very kind introduction. This is the 21st John Curtin Prime Ministerial Library Lecture, and as our Vice-Chancellor has told us, it's had a very distinguished past. In 2015, I was asked by one of my predecessors, the one and only Paul Keating, if I would take over from him as patron of the John Curtin Library and attend these lectures each year. I felt honoured to be asked and I readily accepted. At my first lecture, I had the privilege of hearing Peter Fitzsimmons, author, columnist and now ABC documentary maker, deliver this lecture. Peter brought to the task his amazing knack of making history come alive. 
Last year I delivered the lecture myself and took the opportunity in my capacity as chair of Beyond Blue to offer some remarks on mental health and leadership. So rich is the legacy of John Curtin that I'm certain deliverers of this annual lecture will always be able to find new insights into the man and new ways of reflecting on leadership. We will always be fascinated by what it is like to lead in the most dire of circumstances and to endure. For Australia, Curtin is that emblematic figure, in the way Winston Churchill is for the United Kingdom and Franklin D. Roosevelt was for the United States. Curtin saw us through. His discernment of the strategic imperative to align Australian national security interests with those of the United States was as far-sighted a foreign policy decision as any undertaken by any Prime Minister in office. We honour and remember John Curtin as a wartime leader, but his legacy is also one of an institution builder. He laid the foundation stones on which our tax and pension systems have been built by focusing the Australian economy on the needs of the total war effort. To do this, the Curtin government guaranteed Commonwealth financial assistance to the states, provided they did not attempt to collect their own income taxes, bringing an enduring change to federal state relations. To ease opposition within the Labor Party to increase taxes as a result of this new regime, the government used some of the increased revenue to introduce a Commonwealth widow's pension. The beginning of 1943 saw the Curtin government create a national welfare fund financed from consolidated revenue as an integral part of the government's plans for the social security of the people. Unemployment, sickness and pharmaceutical benefits followed. The effects of these and many other reforms flow to us today. Reforms such as the 1942 Women's Employment Act, allowing women to perform work previously done by men, and the Commonwealth Electoral Wartime Act 1943, giving servicemen aged 18 to 21 the right to vote if they had served overseas. The Curtin legacy is one of courageous decision-making in the face of the enemy and compassion for those in need. John Curtin both saved and built our nation. What would he have thought of today's Australia? I like to think if John Curtin, through some magic, could slip into the back of this lecture theatre, he would be gratified to know his name was still venerated. But as a restless reformer, that wouldn't be enough for him. Instead, he would want to understand Australia's journey from his era to the present day. Then once up to speed, he would be urging us onwards, urging us to keep reforming, to fearlessly embrace the future, to always aim to be stronger and fairer. So tonight, in that spirit of looking forward to the future, as well as reflecting on the past, I have the great pleasure of introducing Stan Grant to present this evening's lecture. Stan has been a mainstay of Australian media over the last 30 years. He is known in most Australian households through his work on several current affairs programs, including Today Tonight, Sunday Sunrise and Real Life. During his career, Stan has hosted major news and current affairs programs on Australian commercial and public TV. He has been a political correspondent for the ABC, a Europe correspondent for the Seven Network based in London, and a senior international correspondent for the international broadcaster CNN based in Hong Kong and Beijing. He has brought us the stories we need to know from around Australia and the world, including from conflict zones like Afghanistan, Iraq and Northern Ireland. He has covered the major events of our era, including the release of Nelson Mandela, the death of Princess Diana and the South Asia tsunami, to name just a few. Stan has won many awards throughout his distinguished career. He's been the recipient of an Australian TV Logie, a Columbia University DuPont Award, which is the broadcast equivalent of the Pulitzer Prize, and the prestigious US Peabody Award. He is a four-time winner of the highly prized Asia TV Awards, including Reporter of the Year. 
Currently, Stan Grant is the ABC's Chief Asia Correspondent, Indigenous Affairs Editor and host of the ABC's current affairs program, Matter of Fact. Stan is a proud member of the Wiradjuri tribe. In 2016, he moved the nation through a powerful contribution to a debate on racism, in which he said, the Australian dream, we sing of it and recite it in verse. Australians all let us rejoice, for we are young and free. My people die young. We die 10 years younger than average Australians, and we are far from free. We are fewer than 3 per cent of the Australian population, and yet we are 25 per cent, a quarter of those Australians, locked up in our prisons. And if you are a juvenile, it is worse, it is 50 per cent. And an, in, an Indigenous child is more likely to be locked up in prison than to finish high school. Stan has worked tirelessly to change those statistics and to achieve a future of reconciliation and true equality. To this end, Stan is currently a special advisor to the Prime Minister on Indigenous constitutional recognition. He has written two books, The Tears of Strangers and Talking to My Country, which weave his personal story into messages which challenge us to move beyond racism. This year, he is publishing The Urgency of Now, in which he strives to answer the question, how can we change our national story on race? Stan is an advocate and an accomplished Australian, a newsbreaker and a newsmaker, a man with a remarkable life story and a vision for the future. Please join me in welcoming Stan Grant to deliver this year's John Curtin Lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, that wonderful introduction. Uh, to the traditional people of this land, from my people, the Wiradjuri, I bring Yinjamara respect. Thank you so much for having me on your land. To invited guests, members of the Curtin family, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for having me here. It's one of the great honours of my life to be able to give this lecture, particularly when you consider who has come before me. John Curtin spent a lot of time on trains and I wanted to begin my lecture with a train journey of my own. It was Christmas Eve 2004 when my family boarded a train to China. Typically, I almost missed it. For years it seems that I'd lived my life at a rush. Just that morning I'd been on air for my last shift at CNN's broadcast centre in Hong Kong. I'd been anchoring the morning news program there since 2001, beamed out across the world to a potential audience of millions. But I was chafing against the limitations of the studio. I longed to breathe the air, to go to where news was made. I wanted to swap the air-conditioned comfort for the wind and the rain and the heat. I wanted to sweat. I wanted exhaustion. I wanted history. And now I had my wish bound for Beijing. The train was ready to pull out. The immigration official had just handed me my stamped passport and I pushed through the gate, dragging my carry-on bag behind me. My wife and three young sons were already on board. Ahead was our journey into a new civilization, a place of ancient thought, revolution, famine and war. The most populous nation on earth was about to welcome five new people. The train trip was my idea. This was a ritual. I wanted us to savour this move. I didn't want the view from 30,000 feet. I wanted to feel the earth beneath me. I wanted the view from the window. I wanted to see this land unfold and its people come to life. It was Napoleon who once said of China, let her sleep. For when she wakes, she will shake the world. China was stirring. It wasn't hard to convince my sons. They'd just seen the movie, The Polar Express. <laughs> so their imaginations were fired by thoughts of travelling to the North Pole and Santa Claus. They hung their stockings on the door of the cabin sleeper and we all bedded down and drifted off to the rattle and hum of the railway tracks. 
I woke up to a hard, frosty morning. I wiped the condensation from the window and looked outside. In the distance was an old Buddhist pagoda. The ground was bare and flinty. A man was working a plough tethered to a horse. It struck me then, out here in remote rural China, this was not the West. There was nothing here that felt familiar to me. It mattered nothing to this man that this was Christmas Day. The birth of Jesus, possibly the, this peasant farmer having spent his entire life in atheist communist China, had never heard of him. He was working his field this day, like every day, in his ancestral village, like his father and father before him. But around him, his country was changing. What had been closed was now open. The world was coming. China was on fast forward. Over the next few years, I would report it all. Hundreds of millions of people lifted out of poverty, new cities built seemingly overnight, villages drowned to make way for new dams, high-speed trains. There was always a train journey. I recall shivering in crowded, unheated carriages, carriages with migrant workers heading home for Chinese New Year, migrants chasing the China dream. In my time in China, this old rural nation became an urban one. The sons and daughters of farmers now danced the nights away in city bars. There was a new generation of millionaires with gleaming new shopping malls to spend their money. Mao suits were swapped for Armani. Bicycles swapped for BMWs. Deng Xiaoping didn't actually say it, but he may well have. To get rich is glorious. By the time I left China, a country that once could not feed itself, once the so-called sick man of Asia, had become a power to rival the might of the United States. With an economy on track to overtake America and a military primed to defend this newfound power. When I left, a new man had taken the helm. A man who modelled himself on China's revolutionary leader, the great helmsman Mao Zedong, a man who is now president for life, Xi Jinping. When I woke that cold Christmas morning on a train bound for Beijing, I was on a fast track into the future, a future where, a decade later, we would be talking about the triumph of authoritarianism and the retreat of democracy. The China that I became immersed in had been a long time coming. I could begin that journey at any point in the past 5,000 years and it would be just as fascinating, turbulent and bloody. I want to go back to a time of war in the 20th century when a new global order was taking shape. In 1941, Japan occupied China and was unleashing a ferocious bombing campaign to break the Chinese resistance. On December 7, 1941, the bombing of Pearl Harbor brought the United States into the war in the Pacific. The Allies now joined with the Chinese against Japan, but China was fighting two wars. While united in the effort against the Japanese, the civil war between the nationalists, the Kuomintang, and the communists was on simmer. What had begun in 1927 reignited after 1945. Eventually, Mao Zedong would lead his People's Liberation Army to victory. In 1941, Australia's future too was taking shape. We were at war. In February 1942, Japan would bomb Darwin. Prime Minister John Curtin penned the words that would reset the direction of our nation. In an article in the Melbourne Herald, Curtin made it plain. He wrote, without any inhibition of any kind, I make it quite clear that Australia looks to America, free of any pangs as to our traditional links or kinship with Britain. Curtin called America the arsenal of democracy. A year later, he would speak directly to the American people. 
On the great waters of the Pacific Ocean, he said, war now breathes its bloody steam. From the skies of the Pacific pours down a deathly hail. It is to the people of America I am now speaking, to you who are or who will be fighting, to you who are sweating in factories or workshops to turn out the vital munitions of war, to all of you who are making sacrifices in one way or another to provide the enormous resources required for our great task. Curtin looked to the spirit of America and made his oath. I pledge to you my word, we will not fail. As I have said, you must be our leader. We will pull knee to knee with you for every ounce of our weight. To steal a line from the former US Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, someone described as the most consequential American diplomat of the 20th century, John Curtin, was present at the creation. Acheson was talking about the creation of a new world, a post-World War II global order helmed by the United States. Pax Americana, despite critics who equate it with American imperialism, embraced the strengths of multilateralism, the Bretton Woods Agreement that set the rules and institutions of the international monetary system, the United Nations Security Council designed to maintain international peace, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade that in 1995 was replaced by the World Trade Organization. The Marshall Plan rebuilt Japan and Germany out of the ruins of war, turning old foes into new allies. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, was formed in 1949, forging a military alliance between North America and European nations to defend each other, as Article 5 states, an attack on one is an attack on all. In 1951, Australia, New Zealand and the United States signed their own security treaty, ANZUS, a commitment of military cooperation. Despite strains that have seen New Zealand suspended in the 1980s, the Australia-US alliance remains strong. John Curtin's pledge of pulling knee to knee holds. This global order was undoubtedly good for America. The United States has grown to become economically and militarily the most powerful nation the world has ever seen. Its influence has expanded via its soft power and pervasive culture. We watch its movies, wear its fashion, drink its soft drink and eat its food. People the world over have sought to immigrate and become Americans or emulate and become more like America. What was good for America was good too for those of us allied with it. The post-World War II economic boom became known as the golden age of capitalism. During the 1950s, OECD countries averaged economic growth of 4% a year and 5% a year in the 60s. The second half of the 20th century was a boom time for democracy. Germany emerged from the trauma of Nazism. South Africa threw off the yoke of apartheid. Decolonisation across Africa and Asia created new, free, democratic nations that in other parts of the world, Latin America and Europe, autocratic regimes were swept aside. Between 1970 and 2010, the number of democracies in the world increased from 35 to 100 and 20. According to Freedom House, which measures the health of democracy, 63% of the world lived in democracies. Democracy's appeal is obvious. As The Economist magazine in a recent essay pointed out, democracies are on average richer than non-democracies, are less likely to go to war and have a better record of fighting corruption. More fundamentally, democracy lets people speak their minds and shape their own and their children's futures. It's worth recalling the words of William Churchill, many forms of government have been tried and will be tried in this world of sin and woe. It has been said that democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the others. <laughs> By the beginning of the 1990s, 
This American-led liberal democratic order had triumphed over its great ideological rival, communism. Who could forget the words in 1987 of US President Ronald Reagan to his Soviet counterpart, Mikhail Gorbachev? Mr Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Indeed, in 1989, the Berlin Wall came down. The Soviet Union was dismantled on December 26, 1991, at 7.32 p.m. The Soviet flag was lowered over the Kremlin for the last time. In the United States, a little-known State Department official, Francis Fukuyama, had been looking on and believed he saw not just a pivotal moment for the world, but the very zenith of humanity. He penned an essay published in the National Interest magazine in 1989 with the title, The End of History. The original essay posed it as a question, the end of history, question mark. But he followed it with a book, The End of History and the Last Man. The question mark was gone. To Fukuyama, the course of the world was set. Fukuyama argued that liberal democracy may constitute, quote, the end of mankind's ideological evolution, the final form of human government. As he wrote, as mankind approaches the end of the millennium, the twin crises of authoritarianism and socialist central planning have left only one competitor standing in the ring as an ideology of potential universal validity, liberal democracy the doctrine of individual freedom and popular sovereignty. George H.W. Bush, the 41st president, addressing Congress in 1990, hailed a new optimism. As he said, free from the threat of terror, stronger in the pursuit of justice, and more secure in the quest for peace. President Bush said a new world was struggling to be born. A world where the rule of law supplants the rule of the jungle. Liberal democracy came to be seen as a fait accompli. Those remaining holdouts soon too would be swept aside. In 1997, President Bill Clinton lectured the Chinese leadership saying its refusal to adopt liberal democracy put it, quote, on the wrong side of history. Who would have doubted President Clinton back then? This was the age of globalisation, a more connected world, a more wired world. Borders and trade barriers were coming down, people and goods moving more freely. Europe would soon put aside its blood-soaked history to form a new union. But history is not so predictable, nor so easily tamed. With the vantage of hindsight, we can see how the triumphant West fell prey to hubris. With an unshakable belief in liberalism and its shibboleths, secularism, universalism, individualism, tied to the power of the market. The West went to sleep at the very time when its power and reach was at its height. Political scientist Joseph Nye, the man credited with coining the phrase soft power, in his book, The Paradox of American Power, warned about the dangers of what he saw as American complacency. After the collapse of the Soviet Empire and the end of the Cold War, he said, the United States stopped paying attention to the world and turned its sights <coughs> inward. Even those who did look beyond America, he wrote, became arrogant about our power, arguing we did not need to heed other nations. We seemed both invincible and invulnerable. Political scientist and former Singapore ambassador to the United Nations, Kishore Mabubani, in his new book poses the question, has the West lost it? The short answer, not yet. But history is turning. The West, he says, has been at the forefront of history for 200 years, but now it must adapt to a world it no longer dominates. Mabubani says Fukuyama's end of history did a lot of brain damage. Having won the Cold War, the West went on autopilot. In 2008, journalist and political commentator Fareed Zakaria published his book, The Post-American World. The United States, he said, was not vanishing. 
that other powers had risen to challenge it. My career as a journalist has spanned this extraordinary moment in history. I've spent the best part of two decades outside of Australia with a front row seat at the biggest events of our time. It has taken me from the mountains of Pakistan and Afghanistan to blood-soaked markets ripped apart by terrorist bombings, to the fall of Saddam Hussein. I've peered into the closed world of North Korea, watched up close as apartheid fell in South Africa, saw the People's Liberation Army cross the border into Hong Kong as China reclaimed its territory, saw a new nation born in East Timor and a peace deal signed to end the troubles in Northern Ireland. Three pivotal moments stand out. They have helped set a new course for the 21st century. The rise of Islamist terrorism, the global financial crisis, and the increasing power of China. The attack on the US on September 11, 2001 was a devastating rejection of so-called Western values by a small but enormously influential radicalised group of Islamists. Osama bin Laden's al-Qaeda was weaponising religion, not for the first time in history, and violently rejecting the ideals of universalism individualism and secularism. It sparked a war on terror that has spanned from Afghanistan to Iraq and has morphed into new theatres across the Middle East, Africa and Southeast Asia. London, Brussels, Paris, Jakarta, Nairobi, Sydney are just some of the cities that have felt the reach of terrorism. It remains a war without end. In 2008, the collapse of the big banks, which sparked what was to become known as the global financial crisis, rocked the foundations of the liberal democratic order. On a personal level, economic collapse cost jobs and houses, but more broadly, as The Economist magazine pointed out, the damage the crisis did was psychological as well as financial. It revealed fundamental weaknesses in the West's political systems undermining the self-confidence that had been one of their great assets. People who lost their homes and livelihoods looked on aghast as the banks were deemed too big to fail. Those who profited from a corrupt exploitative system who rigged the game in their favour, signing up gullible, vulnerable people to a complex financial shell game, seemed to pay little or no price. The global financial crisis has shone a spotlight on the growing inequality to ordinary people, the game looked rigged. The lifeblood of democracy is faith and trust. If people feel cheated, if governments fail to deliver on the promise of a better future, then the future of democracy itself is at risk. While the liberal democratic West struggled, I was reporting on the China economic juggernaut. It was continuing to grow, defying warnings of imminent collapse while steadfastly determinedly rejecting what we in the West call universal values. It has defied the march of history, adapting the bits of Western capitalism that suit, but rejecting liberalism. Indeed, under Xi Jinping, China is doubling down on authoritarianism. More than a decade ago, historian Azar Gat, writing in the journal Foreign Affairs, identified China's brand of authoritarian capitalism as the greatest challenge to the global liberal order. As he wrote, as China rapidly narrows the economic gap with the developed world, the possibility looms that it will become a true authoritarian superpower. It's one of the ironies of history that it was the power and the ideas of the West that have underwritten China's rise. Historian Neil Ferguson says China has been the big winner of the liberal order. He points out that in 1980, China accounted for 2% of the world economy. Now it is nearly 20%, more than the US and Canada combined. As America has been bogged down by war and financial collapse, the Chinese Communist Party could claim it has a better model. It may be too soon to imagine a China-dominated world. The US can count scores of alliances to China's near two. North Korea and Pakistan. But Beijing is expanding its reach. 
developing transactional relationships into Africa, Central Asia and the Pacific. It's extending its economic influence via the Asia Infrastructure and Investment Bank and its One Belt, One Road initiative, a new Silk Road of infrastructure and investment, will potentially cover more than 68 countries, 65% of the world's population and 40% of global GDP. Not for nothing has this been called China's Marshall Plan. Kishore Mabubani says the West has missed this, as it has missed the growth of Asia more generally from India to Indonesia. He says the two critical decades that saw the return of China and India, the 1990s and 2000s, coincided with a period of maximum insularity and self-congratulation. For Mabubani, the trail leads back to Fukuyama and the end of history. Western rulers, he says, fell in love with that essay and began to believe that their society had reached the top of the metaphorical Mount Everest of human development. But Francis, Francis Fukuyama, at least in his original essay, did acknowledge the prospect that history would return. It is a part of his essay too easily overlooked. The end of history, he wrote, will be a very sad time. In the post-historical period, there will be neither art nor philosophy, just the perpetual caretaking of the museum of human history. He warned of a nostalgia for the time when history existed. As he concluded, perhaps the end of history will serve to get history started again. History is indeed back. Take a snapshot of our world. You could be forgiven for thinking we are edging toward the abyss. Sleepwalking to catastrophe is how some have put it. We have a nuclear armed North Korea, a belligerent Russia renewing talk of a Cold War, the threat of conflict in the South China Sea, the spectre of fascism, resurgent populism, a return to hard borders, rising xenophobia, a retreat from global trade and refuge in protectionist policies, the potential fracturing of Europe. This is all played out against the drumbeat of anger, voices of resurgent nationalism, tribalism, sectarianism. The very idea of liberalism that undergirds democracy is under attack. Freedom House released a report entitled Freedom in the World, Discarding Democracy, the Return of the Iron Fist. It found an erosion in civil liberties and the rule of law, claiming that democracy was, quote, under greater threat than at any point in the last 25 years. Countries have taken an autocratic turn. The political strongman is ascendant, tightening his grip in authoritarian regimes or consolidating power at the ballot box. Turkey, under Recep Tayyip Erdogan, is cracking down on opponents and locking up journalists. Vladimir Putin jails his rivals. Hungary's Viktor Orban has transformed from one-time student democracy campaigner to political demagogue who now boasts of his illiberal democracy. Add to that al-Sisi in Egypt, Duterte in the Philippines and of course Xi Jinping in China. They each spin a seductive tale of national greatness, ethnic or religious purity, a narrative of historical grievance and a permanent enemy. Each promises to make his country great again. Cue Donald Trump. He tapped into a deep wellspring of disillusion and resentment that took him to the White House. When he spoke of draining the swamp, he appealed to those people who believed the Washington elite had abandoned them. And why wouldn't they? These are the people, remember, that Barack Obama once mocked as clinging to their God and their guns, who Hillary Clinton, much I'm sure to her regret, labelled the deplorables. Trump, like populists everywhere, has exploited the blowback against globalisation, those who feel they lost their jobs and their country. His pledge to reopen factories and close up borders struck a chord. His appeal is to the worst fears of his nation, 
where once Ronald Reagan spoke of America as the shining city on the hill, Donald Trump talks of American carnage. When Donald Trump speaks to his people, many Americans believe him. President Trump has arrived at a critical time. He is both a product of democracy and, to his critics, a harbinger of its end. His vow to put America first comes at a time when American power and prestige is waning. Trump could appear to be set on dismantling the liberal order that John Curtin envisaged in 1941. He has publicly humiliated allies, questioned the future of NATO, withdrawn from the UN Human Rights Council, pulled out of the Paris Climate Accord and walked away from the Trans-Pacific Partnership a critical plank in Obama's pivot to Asia to offset Chinese influence. We have the remainder of this term and perhaps four more years after that to see where the Trump presidency takes us. Rather than being the architect of American retreat, however, Donald Trump is a symptom. The unveiling has been underway for nearly two decades. George W. Bush's decision to invade Iraq on the faulty pretense that Saddam Hussein held a store of weapons of mass destruction and represented an existential threat, drained America of blood and treasure, and it can be argued, made the world more dangerous. Barack Obama, whose presidency spanned much of this time, was seen as a defender of the liberal order, but for all of his civility, poise and eloquence, not to mention his Nobel Prize, there is a case to be made that Obama too left the world in a precarious place. Think about it. Islamic State had carved out a caliphate in Iraq and Syria. Iran and Saudi Arabia were locked in a power play, spilling over into a proxy war in Yemen. Syria was torn apart by civil war with Bashar al-Assad entrenched in power. Russia was reasserting its influence in the Middle East. Putin had annexed Crimea. China militarised the disputed islands of the South China Sea. North Korea became a nuclear armed power and the European Union began to come apart. The Obama years had begun with a theme of hope. Remember his victory speech? This was the moment, he said, when the rise of the oceans began to slow and the planet began to heal. His critics called that the Moses speech. Eight years later, those same critics declared the Obama presidency a failure in the sober-minded journal Foreign Affairs, Harvard University's Professor of International Relations, Stephen Walt, declared the Obama years a tragedy, especially when it comes to foreign policy. When we're remembering the great leaders Julia Gillard spoke about, Curtin, Churchill, Roosevelt, where are the leaders of today? The leaders of the free world have leaders in recent times exhibited the capacity, foresight, judgment and persuasion to successfully navigate our changing world? The challenge for the United States is not necessarily to preserve its hegemony with intervention, confrontation or obstruction. As Michael Mazar, Rand Corporation political scientist, warns that approach could accelerate US decline. He says America must learn to navigate and lead a truly more diversified, pluralistic system that is materialising. Mazar says geopolitical rivals Russia, India and China are looking for a greater seat at the table. They have seen how the US has leveraged its leadership to exploit the global order to suit its ends, ignoring the rules when convenient. Vladimir Putin has long complained that the West insulted Russia after the Cold War enlarging NATO into Eastern Europe, supporting moves against Russian-backed leaders. Putin is warned of a confrontation of visions on global governance if the West attempts to, in his words, retain a monopoly on geopolitical domination. Joseph Nye says fears of China overthrowing the world order are exaggerated. China instead, he says, has tried to increase its influence in it. China has bolstered its contribution to key international planks of the global order, the UN, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank. 
Xi Jinping has said openly that China has been a participant, builder and contributor and stands firmly for the international order. Yet there is a paradox. While China has blended with the global order, it does not share its liberal values. It rejects the rulings it doesn't like. Beijing feels the global institutions are dominated still by the US and Western democracies. China is establishing its own rival entities and networks. US leadership requires the ability to work with rivals while not abandoning its democratic principles. Evan Fagenbaum, a former high-ranking State Department official, has put it best. For Washington rebalancing power, he says, poses an uncomfortable trade-off between liberalism and effectiveness. Fagenbaum says many contests of wills lie ahead and the US will need to pick its fights more carefully. It begs the question, at what point does America say this far and no farther? Pax Americana, if it is not yet over, certainly could go, just like Pax Britannica or Pax Romana. Geopolitics has shifted the West's conceit that China or post-Cold War Russia would become more like us has not materialised. Political scientist Bruno Marques, writing recently in American Interests, in an essay titled America's Pivot from the West, said, America is bruised and disillusioned and looking for something less ideal. Historian Stephen Kotkin reminds us that states rise fall and compete with one another, he says great power politics now will drive events and international rivalries will be decided by the relative capacities of the competitors. Richard Haast, the President of the US Council on Foreign Relations, in his book with the ominous title A World in Disarray, argues that the disruptions of globalisation have challenged the ability of the world to cope, he says, at a time when American share of global power is shrinking. Last year, The Economist magazine carried a front page headline declaring China's Xi Jinping the most powerful leader on the planet. As Pax Americana fades, there are those who fear so too inevitably will democracy. The question is, what comes next? Democracy has been tested before, Many historians draw parallels today with the rise of fascism in the 1930s that led to World War II. Then too it emerged out of economic collapse, powered by a blowback against Western globalisation. Heed these words from Benjamin Carter Hett in his new book, The Death of Democracy, Hitler's Rise to Power. This is what he says. For years he was constantly mocked and underestimated. He brought some unusual talents to the game. He had a rare ability to captivate a crowd with his voice, much less obvious to contemporaries was his uncanny intuition, his ability to read what people felt and wanted to hear and to predict what they would do next. Sound familiar? It's ridiculous to argue that Donald Trump is Adolf Hitler and certainly America is not Weimar Republic, Germany. But it is a reminder that we create our leaders. The media has been complicit in this, in its elitism, its sneering and mockery, not just of Trump, but his supporters. 1930s Germany was considered one of the most educated, literate, sophisticated societies on earth, but it was deeply damaged traumatised by World War I and angry at the treaty of Versailles. Hitler tapped into the national humiliation. As Hett says, millions of Germans retreated into conspiracy theories that they were beset by conspiratorial cliques of communists, capitalists, Jews and Freemasons. Hitler could give voice to this flight from reality as could no other German politician of his time. Historian David Runciman says this may not be a rerun of the 1930s. Democracy, he says, may end in ways we cannot yet even foresee. He says it is wrong to see populism as anti-democratic. It is the essence of democracy. 
but it carries with it the seed of destruction. Runciman fears it could lead to a hollowing out of liberal institutions. As he says, this is the crisis facing Western democracies. We don't know what failure looks like anymore and we have no idea how much trouble we're in. Democracy is battling on multiple fronts. There are new challenges posed by ageing populations, digital technology, artificial intelligence. Will robots get a vote? Inequality, climate change, mass dislocation of people and forced migration. Social media presents new opportunities and crises. Facebook, with two billion users, is the biggest population on the planet and not confined to borders, ethnicities, economies or faiths. It connects us but exposes us at the same time. Twitter has helped fire social revolutions but has also unleashed hatred and division. It's a place where the violence and intimidation runs rampant and that people hiding behind anonymity are free from the reach of the law. The safeguards of our society cannot keep pace with our technology. David Runciman warns that the threats to democracy may already be greater than democracy's capacity to withstand them. Harvard University professors in government Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt are concerned enough to have written a new book, How Democracies Die. Democracies die in war, they write, but they also die at the hands of elected leaders. Presidents or prime ministers who subvert the very process that brought them to power. They worry about Donald Trump's attack on judges and the media and fear that the United States will abandon its role as an international democracy promoter. But they stress this democratic drift precedes Trump. As they write, the soft guardrails of American democracy have been weakening for decades. So in 2018, this is what confronts us. Democracy and liberalism is being assailed from without and within. America is in retreat, led by a man who gives little indication that he even believes in the so-called global rules-based order. China is a viable challenger, soon to become the biggest economy in the world, extending its influence and building a powerful military. Authoritarianism is on the rise and a new wave of political leaders are exploiting resurgent populism fueled by fear, anxiety and xenophobia. Those who have seen their jobs shipped offshore, their factories shut down, who've lost their homes and worry about losing control of their countries to immigrants, have lost faith in institutions and politics as usual and are exacting their revenge. It was part of the hubris of the end of history to forget that history matters, identity matters, language matters, faith matters, nations matter. In the giddy rush to an imagined utopian cosmopolitan world of universal values, the globalists overlook those who cling to what Edmund Burke once called the little platoons. Worse, they disdained them or mocked them as ignorant and bigoted. They stopped speaking to them and spoke down to them. When Donald Trump donned a NASCAR cap and scoffed down Big Macs, he connected. Yes, he was a billionaire, but he spoke like ordinary people. He ate what ordinary people ate. He liked their sports and he looked authentic. When he said America first, they liked what they heard. At this instinctive level, Donald Trump understands the politics of our age, even as thus far he displays little of the acumen to manage it. The Leviathan is reawakened. George H.W. Bush's post-Cold War dream of greater cooperation is quickly being supplanted by big power politics that now threaten to define this age. The conservative political journal Standpoint recently called this Trump doctrine a return of sovereignty, the primacy of the nation state, that President Trump himself has said remains, quote, the best vehicle for elevating the human condition. I believe in cosmopolitanism. As a man who has lived in five different countries and reported from scores more, I confidently call myself a citizen of the world. Yet I hear British Prime Minister Theresa May when she says, if you believe you are a citizen of the world, you are a citizen of nowhere 
you don't understand what citizenship means. From the days of Athens, democracy has sat uncomfortably with citizenship. Who belongs? The Athenians were defined by who was excluded as much as who was included. Cosmopolitanism just does not speak to a Brexit or Trump voter or here in Australia, a Pauline Hanson One Nation supporter. If Western cosmopolitan liberals want to reclaim history, they will need to find a better story. China has a story. Xi Jinping knows his people when he speaks of the hundred years of humiliation by foreign powers. Vladimir Putin touches something deeply held when he speaks of Russian nationalism, Russian Orthodox religion and a lament for the glory of the Soviet Empire. Recep Tayyip Erdogan tells a uniquely Turkish story. Viktor Orban knows what it is to be Hungarian. These are narratives that touch something in the darkest and most troubling parts of the national soul, yet are all the more powerful for that. The return of the power of the nation is also the return of identity. In many ways, identity worries me. Hyper-identity can kill. Think of Hutu versus Tutsi in Rwanda, Hindu pitted against Muslim in India and Pakistan, Palestinian versus Israeli, Catholic and Protestant in Ireland, the internal Muslim blood feud between Sunni and Shia, identity spawned in history and nourished on violence can exert a deadly hold. The Indian economist and philosopher Amartya Sen has warned against what he calls solitarist identities. He says it can be a good way of misunderstanding nearly everyone in the world. When we divide ourselves, he writes, our shared humanity gets savagely challenged. At its worst, the politics of identity appears to me like that line from Franz Kafka, a cage went in search of a bird. It is rigid and conformist, often policed by self-righteous moral and political guardians. Identity has its own orthodoxy and imposes its own tyranny. History is the breeding ground of the politics of identity. History is betrayal, a narrative of loss, inheritance robbed. American political scientist Mark Lilla has condemned the growth of identity politics as a cancer on democracy. He fears that we are sacrificing the idea of shared citizenship. In his recent book, The Once and Future Liberal, he despairs at how identity liberalism banished the word we to the outer reaches of respectable political discourse. Lilla says it is disastrous as a foundation for democratic politics. America, he says, is in a moral panic about racial, gender and sexual identity that is distorting liberalism's core message. It impedes progressive politics becoming a unifying force. He believes it cost Hillary Clinton the presidency and propelled Trump to the White House. White working class Americans showed they can play identity politics too. The potency of identity politics is an attack on democracy from within. It can create an atomised, tribalised, fractured polity. It's another indication that the West has lost its way. It exposes a crisis of confidence. Criticism and scepticism are virtues of the West. It helps keep the worst aspects of nationalism at bay. But there also seems to be an increasing tendency to apologise too readily for Western traditions or overly qualify the success of the West. I understand that. As an Indigenous Australian, my family has been scarred by the worst of Western civilisation. Colonisation has been the handmaiden of Western civilisation. We have experienced the trauma of dispossession and dispersal. Legislated discrimination locked us out of Australia and as individuals we have endured the daily wounds of racism. Yet, and I don't speak for all Aboriginal people, I can celebrate the fact that it has been this nation's profound democratic liberal traditions that have put me here today. Indigenous people have fought through the courts and at the ballot box to find justice. The 1992 Mabo High Court decision, the 1967 referendum, a powerful proof that the institutions of democracy can work for us. As an individual, I have set my star by the values of the Enlightenment, the belief in freedom, the power of reason, the universalism of humanity. Think of Immanuel Kant's ideas of liberty. 
the foundation of enlightenment itself that we should strive to live in his words, free of the ball and chain of an everlasting permanent minority. I do not overlook that these philosophers of the Enlightenment did not carry their own prejudice and outright racism, but their ideas shine greater than their failings. In the words of French philosopher Pascal Bruckner, Western civilization is like a jailer who throws you into prison but slips you the key. Tyranny, racism, colonization are part of the Western tradition, yet that same tradition holds out the tantalizing possibility of liberty. It's that very idea that is at risk in our age. It is also liberal democracy's greatest last line of defence. It is liberalism that can truly speak of the equality of all and hold despots to, to account. It is liberalism that can truly say government of the people, by the people, for the people. Today, all over the world, People are asking the question, what is a nation? The French historian Ernest Renan was grappling with this idea of history and identity more than a century ago. Renan wrote that nations seek a collective identity. Nation, he wrote, is a soul, a spiritual principle. But how to form a nation out of the conflicting stories of our past? It's a question that rings as loudly here in Australia as anywhere. Who are we? What do we stand for? Who belongs in our nation? What do we ask of each other? At a time when nations are seeking to redefine themselves and too readily looking to the darkest recesses of their psyche, we have a chance to speak to our better angels. This past year, we've seen the Indigenous people present our nation with a unique opportunity, a gesture to find that elusive national soul. The Uluru Statement from the Heart is a powerful affirmation of faith in our democracy. It seeks to locate Indigenous people in the heart of a constitution first written to exclude them. It emerged from negotiations across Australia culminating in the symbolic heart of this land, Uluru. It asks for a truth and justice process, a move to drafting a makarata, a Yongu word from Arnhem Land, acknowledging making peace after a struggle. And it looks to blend the fundamental spiritual sovereignty of Indigenous people with the political sovereignty of the Commonwealth. Its key recommendation an Indigenous body, a voice, enshrined in the Constitution to ensure Indigenous people some input into policy making directed toward them. Consider the words, we seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk in two worlds and their culture will be a gift to their country. A gift to their country. The Uluru Statement is its own gift. The gift of a national story, a story that begins 60,000 years ago and finds its fulfilment in the constitution of our nation. It encapsulates the group rights of the first people of this land but holds too to the fundamental tenet of liberalism, the inalienable freedom of the individual, potentially releasing Indigenous people from the grip of intergenerational despair to give full flower to their own aspirations in our nation. The Uluru Statement is a remarkable document, coming at a time of profound questions about the future of democracy, coming at a time when democracy globally is in retreat. That it comes from those who have carried the greatest burden, who have walked the farthest distance and felt the most estranged from this nation's democratic process makes it all the more extraordinary. 
The Uluru Statement could have been an appeal to vengeance. It could have fed a narrative of grievance. It could have played to the worst of identity politics and sought to divide our nation. If it had, it would deservedly have been condemned. Instead, it seeks to bring Indigenous people closer to the Australian nation and Australians closer to us. The Prime Minister has rejected it, as is his right. That's how it's supposed to work. Democracy relies on persuasion and negotiation. But it has not diminished the Uluru Statement's power. It's walking its way around the country, speaking to Australians. It will find its place. To borrow from Francis Fukuyama, it could stand as our end of history moment, completing our liberal democracy, one of the oldest and most resilient on earth. Last Christmas, my family was on another train. We were huddled up against the cold on the New York subway. We were in the United States for my youngest son's basketball tour. He is in love with all things America. It's where he sees his future. This indigenous boy from Australia believes in the dream of America. John Curtin looked to America at a time of war. And the new order he and others helped form has shone a great, great light on our world. For my son's sake, I hope that light doesn't dim. I'm heartened by the words of the French political writer and diplomat Alexis de Tocqueville, who in the 19th century famously travelled to America to encounter that nation's experiment in democracy. He saw its vices and its virtues. But as he wrote, democracies always look weaker than they really are. They are all confusion on the surface but have lots of hidden strengths. Thank you so much. wonderfully uh, thoughtful and inspiring 2018 JCPML anniversary lecture, so thank you again. I'd like to ask the Vice-Chancellor to come forward and present you with a gift on behalf of the <laughs> well, The spread chain you just said next to me, it was a tour de force, <laughs> so it's a privilege to have had you here and thank you very much, Stan. to all of our guests, thank you very much to you also for being here today. It wouldn't be the lecture without you. Uh, and I would also like to acknowledge before I finish the Curtin Library and Corporate Events staff who've helped to organise the event today. So that brings our formal proceedings to a close, but I would ask you all if you wouldn't mind just staying in your seats while our VIP guests exit and then you're welcome to join us outside in the foyer and spilling out into the cafe next door for some refreshments. Thank you very much. Thank you.